Okay, so we are welcoming our museum professional panelists here today. For those of you who are watching this at a later time, if you have any questions at all for our panelists, please email me um, and I'll put my email in the chat box so you can see that. I want to introduce our panelists um, before they introduce themselves or share their stories. And I'm gonna go in alphabetical order so there's no hurt feelings. And I realized on my list, I don't know the alphabet. <laughs> I got out of order here. Um, first up is Kathy Calloway. She's a museum educator, a longtime museum educator for the Museum of Art and Archaeology in Columbia. She's also the editor of Muse. We have Lena Lucci. Lena, did I say your last name right? Uh, Lucy, but you know, Lucy. it kind of goes either way. <laughs> <laughs> Lena Lucy, she is the collections assistant at America's National Churchill Museum here on campus. We have Kristen Pollock, or is it Trout? A uh, new life, my, I go by Trout now, so. <laughs> okay, so Mary Mae yeah. Trout, Kristen Trout. She's with the Missouri Civil War Museum. She's a museum director, and Kristen has had a few different positions um, there at the museum. Uh, we have Tim Riley. He's the Sandra L. and Monroe E. Trout Director and Chief Curator at America's National Church Museum here on campus. And last but not least is Liz Cincy. She is with the St. Louis Science Center, um, hence the giant dinosaur behind her. She is, <laughs> she's the Associate Director of Gallery Programs and Visitor Engagement. So welcome you all um, to this panel. And if you wanna go in that same order to do your, your story, um, feel free to do that. So Kathy, if you'd like to go first, sure, um, feel free. And again, if you have any questions, sure, you can put them in the chat box, or again, we can share at the end. Yeah, and feel free to cut me off. I will talk. Okay. Quickly. And if anybody has any questions, um, I guess maybe save them to the end. Um, okay. I put down uh, my title, um, and I also PhD, because I did want to say that while I have a PhD, that is not a requirement for an educator. I think a lot of times now, and we can talk about this later, if you're a curator, you are expected to have a PhD because that proves that you can do deep research um, about artists or other things. And um, that's not necessarily the case at the, um, uh, for a museum educator or a preparator or other different staff positions at a museum. Um, I would say, though, that my having a PhD probably helped me get this job 15 years ago because um, it's an, I work at an academic museum at the Museum of Art and Archaeology at the university. And I think that the director at the time who hired me was trying to stack up some PhDs. So, but, you know, again, it's, it's not a requirement. And I also always say to anybody who will listen, and especially kids, when you grow up, don't want to be president of the United States because that looks like a really hard job. Want to be a museum educator because it's fun, it's interesting. You get to work with all ages. So I, I really think I ended up with a great job. I actually um, volunteered as an undergraduate at uh, the Milwaukee Public Museum, and then I volunteered and also had some paid uh, positions at the museum. Here I got my master's degree at. Um, uh, MU. And I really recommend that. And unfortunately, you can't say to me, oh, I'll volunteer for you because our museum is currently closed. Let's see if I can. Okay. There we go. Sorry. So this is where we are now, but it's currently closed because we're getting ready to um, move back to campus. Um, I just want to give a quick background for um, the museum. We're the third largest visual arts museum in the state. And so I will let the Nelson Atkins and St. Louis Art Museum duke it out for who the biggest one is. Um, but we're the third, so that's pretty impressive. Um, and we've got art objects from everywhere. Uh, but we have the problem that many museums have. We don't have enough space to show everything. And I also think it's important to point out that we get 25,000 people um, every year. So. This is um, just a shot of one of our galleries with the bathing nymphs. And we are getting ready to move back to campus. 
Um, we're currently now on the business group, but we're going to move back to Ellis Library. Uh, we're getting the uh, lower floor uh, on the West Wing. So anyway, we're excited about being back on campus. And here are all the artworks that we packed and all palletized and into our new space. Okay, then I wanted to talk briefly about my duties as an educator. Um, I am a volunteer coordinator, uh, especially the docents. Docents are tour guides and they're trained by the museum's curators. I also inv am involved in their training and they also take some classes at MU. And the training lasts a whole school year, so two semesters. Um, there's also an auxiliary docent program for students. When we moved off campus, um, I had to sort of stop that, but I'm hoping to restart it again when we're back on campus. It's a good way for students to get involved when they don't have a year to be trained. They can be trained in specific exhibitions or specific special um, ideas and, or um, ways that they can bring people in and interpret things. I also wanted to point out that Westminster students have participated in museum events, uh, both as volunteers, but I've also had a couple interns from the, uh, Westminster. Um, uh, I work with docents, I facilitate their training. This is a, a, just a shot of uh, the curator here, Benton Kidd, training some docents, talking about the Egyptian case. Uh, also, I needed volunteers when I offer things like National Museum Day, um, which we used to do every year in conjunction with the Smithsonian. Um, and so we needed students and all sorts of uh, community people to help uh, take care of booths and answer questions and, and offer activities and events as well. I also plan family events and some other educational events. And that's always fun to have um, families come in and do crafts. This was a mask making um, event. I also was the advisor, and I keep saying was, because now that we're closed, I'm not doing that anymore, but I hope to uh, revive all this. I was the advisor, uh, we had a Museum Advisory Council of Students, um, and I was their advisor for undergrads and graduate students. I was particularly proud that we had both um, grads and undergrads because they could sort of mentor one another and talk to one another about challenges and things like that. Um, we had uh, events like Art After Dark, which weren't just for MU students. Um, again, as I said, some Westminster students came over several times, several different years and helped with that. And we also welcomed kids. And so anyway, they were always fun. This was something that um, actually the museum kind of changed for me. When I interviewed for the job, I said that I really enjoyed uh, the museum film series when I was a graduate student and I was sorry that they didn't have it. And so after they hired me the second day I came in, they said, okay, now you can start a film series. So, um, you know, sometimes if you have some special interest, you can kind of seg your job into that. And I was really lucky to be able to do that. Um, I also proofread and help edit a lot of the materials that come out of the museum. Uh, the director just sent me uh, their Christmas card that they're sending out and asked me to proofread it. And I fortunately didn't find any mistakes, but that's one of my responsibilities. That isn't something that you would expect to be doing as an educator. Um, you know, it's just something that I actually was trained in doing um, when I actually volunteered and worked at this museum long ago. And um, it's something that I enjoy doing. And I ended up being editor of Muse, I was helping uh, put it out. And then when the person who was the editor um, retired, I got the job. So that was nice. So finally, uh, I always want to point out that I could not do my job with all the wonderful volunteers we have without the Museum Associates, which is our support group, without students, and without my other fellow staff members. Um, anyway, thank you. Thank you, Kathy. Lena, would you like to go next? Yeah, sure. Let me pull up. Did I keep it under 10? Yeah, you did great. Excellent. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, mine will be, I'll be pretty brief as well. So um, I think all of the students here actually know me, but uh, again, I'm Lena Lucy, uh, collections assistant at America's National Churchill Museum. Um, I guess some background. For education, I have a Bachelor of Arts uh, in History from Truman, um, as well 
as I also got uh, a lot of different minors, actually, <laughs> art history, photography, and Italian studies. Um, so also while I was at Truman, uh, they have sort of a program called like scholarship jobs, which is sort of similar to work study, um, but I don't know, it's a little bit different. Um, so while I was there, I also worked um, at the Adair County Historical Society Public Library, uh, as well as the History Department slash 16th Century Journal, um, which is put out by the department. Um, so those were some good experiences, sort of something I do for maybe like a couple hours a week um, and just sort of like get some experience with uh, different sort of ways that things are like cataloged um, or, uh, you know, sort of history organizations. Um, after that, some um, internships and also just sort of like I'll go a little bit into these just so you guys know also like what internships are out there um, that you could look into. Um, I actually did two with the Missouri State Archives. One was the local records program. This is actually on campus at Truman. Uh, there's a, <laughs> a photo of me from 2016 uh, working with the, the records. So what we did with those um, is that we would go through these uh, case files from the court records uh, and we would sort of like process them, um, flatten them, remove glue, remove staples, uh, look through all of the information, put everything in the correct order and then sort of summarize it in a specific way on the file folder. Um, so I guess that was sort of my introduction to archival type work. Uh, after that, I also had uh, an on-site internship over the summer uh, in their reference room where basically um, I would sort of go through their um, reference filing cabinet uh, and sort of continue making an index to that that had been started by some um, previous interns. But they actually have several different internships uh, at the, the state archives that you can do over the summer. Um, another uh, sort of internship slash field school that I did, it's not quite museum related, but it's sort of in the same field public history um, was a buildings, landscapes, and culture field school called Picturing Milwaukee. Um, this was in that year specifically at Sherman Park, um, which is a neighborhood in Milwaukee. And this sort of was a really like interdisciplinary type of um, program. And so at the beginning, um, we went to several different houses in the neighborhood, measured them, made architectural plans, and also um, worked with someone who's at uh, Williamsburg, Colonial Williamsburg. We would sort of like go through the house houses, uh, sort of like detectives, um, and sort of look like, oh, like this door, we can see it used to have like a bunch of different deadbolts. So we can say like probably that this room was rented out at some point to someone else uh, and just sort of do sort of like a house detectives, I guess. Um, and then this sort of the second half of the project, we did a bunch of oral histories of people in the neighborhood. Um, and that was sort of focused on like, what is community? What is a neighborhood? Um, and then and so, uh, after that, we sort of like synthesized all that stuff. If you want to check it out, it's a nice little website. Um, so sort of the way that I came to work here, uh, it's actually that I got an internship here in 2019 to work on a paintings exhibit called Painting as a Pastime from Winston to the White House. This is for the museum's uh, 50th anniversary. So there was a lot, of, a lot of different stuff and projects going on here. I kind of needed somebody to help out with that. Um, and then I guess you could say, I just kind of like never left. <laughs> just kind of like stuck around, uh, ended up doing sort of various tasks um, and then ended up with a project of working on the collections database. So that involved um, looking for um, a new database to replace the old one, which we had sort of like lost access to. Um, and so we sort of like shopped around for a while and then worked with them to bring our records in. Uh, and then since then, uh, as I think some of the students here have helped a little bit um, with that, um, putting, filling out sort of that information with the, um, the, the physical records. Um, so I guess other things that I do. So um, of course the first is to manage 
the objects and the records in the collection, um, which involves the sort of the things I talked about before, but also uh, environmental monitoring, making sure that, you know, sort of paying attention to when the temperature humidity might get too low or too high, um, as well as uh, training students, interns, et cetera, um, in the program and sort of supervising them, um, working with incoming objects, loans, um, things like that, as well as helping to create and install exhibits, answer questions from the public and then also uh, working on social media and, and the website. So some of those like the social media and website are sort of things that I was kind of interested in like learning some HTML and stuff like that. Um, and so I was sort of able to sort of take on some of those projects. Um, but yeah, turn it over to whoever is next. Thank you, Lena. Kristen? All right. Well, first of all, thank you everybody for coming out uh, virtually, I guess, to this really nice uh, panel discussion about museums. Um, first of all, my name is Kristen Trout. I'm the museum director here at the Missouri Civil War Museum in St. Louis. Uh, we're actually located at Historic Jefferson Barracks, uh, so just south of St. Louis. Um, so I've kind of been involved with the Missouri Civil War Museum for a long time. Um, it's kind of been uh, definitely a family endeavor uh, for me. So it's, so the really the founder and the executive director of the museum, it's actually my father. And so I've, I've been just heavily a part of it since really day one. Uh, we started out in 2002, um, actually with the intention of restoring and saving the 1905 Jefferson Barracks Post Exchange and Gymnasium building here at Jefferson Barracks, um, which through that renovation process, uh, we were able to really spark a revitalization of historic Jefferson Barracks from there. But um, the building that, that we're currently in today, again, the 1905 Jefferson Barracks Post Exchange Building um, was sadly abandoned for about 60 years. Um, so right after the Second World War. Um, and, and because of that, it fell into complete disarray. And uh, being in an abandoned building for that long, you're talking extensive damage. Uh, throughout the building. Um, we had our roof collapse. We had um, across all the facades of the building, vines everywhere. We had debris everywhere inside the museum, uh, tons of water damage and, and et cetera. Uh, but through that, you know, really the Missouri Civil War Museum, we operate as a 501c3, um, but we're really a preservation oriented kind of organization. Um, and really with the Missouri Civil War Museum and what we've done, uh, again, we, we started the renovation process back in 2002 and we officially opened to the general public in 2013. Uh, so it was an 11 year process uh, to get the building completely saved and transformed into what is now the state's largest Civil War Museum. Um, and we focus really on uh, Missouri's role in the American Civil War. And we also do talk quite a, quite a bit about the history of Jefferson Barracks as well, and how this building and kind of our role um, has been in a, been a big part of the history of Jefferson Barracks. So uh, we're, we're really proud of, of what we've been able to do with this building. A um, couple other things in regard to the museum itself, um, being a 501c3, being preservation minded, uh, we've been involved in the preservation of numerous buildings on the National Register of Historic Places. Um, so here at Jefferson Barracks, we're part of a National Historical District, um, part of the National Register of Historic Places. So our building, um, as well as the adjacent building, which we call the 1918 Jefferson Barracks Post Exchange Building, which is now our event center, that's also on the National Register. Register. Um, and, and the museum itself has been heavily involved in the preservation of numerous other buildings, including the Loose Dyer Henderson Stark home up in Louisiana, which is in Pike County. Um, that's the former home of US Senator from Missouri, John Brooks Henderson. Uh, that was his house originally uh, for, for several years in the 1870s. Um, and, and he actually was the co-author of the 13th Amendment. Uh, with, with his house in particular back in 2016, uh, it sustained a catastrophic fire um, and it, the, the building itself was, was really falling apart. Um, it was extremely damaged from the fire itself. 
And uh, luckily the museum has been really a part of trying to save that building. So it's completely stabilized and in the process of, of renovation right now. So we've, we've been involved in that. We've been involved in the preservation of uh, numerous memorials, Civil War memorials, in fact. Um, and we also have a couple other buildings as well that we've been uh, involved in that help us to maintain the museum here, continue our mission of preserving Missouri's history, especially the Civil War. Um, so we've been, again, very preservation minded. Now, kind of going to my own background, um, again, as I kind of mentioned before, I've been very involved in the museum uh, when I was very little, uh, really about the age of, I guess, nine years old. Um, I had been in this building when it was in complete disarray, helping out uh, wherever I could. So I really got introduced to the museum world through helping out here at, at the museum itself way before we even opened. Uh, so being a part of that preservation process um, was was huge and, and it certainly made its mark on me. Uh, and then with my family being very history minded, we would go to Civil War battlefields uh, throughout the country and other historic sites and museums. So that really fostered that love of, of museums and history so much. Uh, so by the time I graduated from high school and was looking for a career field, um, I ended up going to Gettysburg College in Gettysburg, Pennsylvania. Uh, where I got my Bachelor of Arts degree in history, as well as Civil War studies there. Um, again, my, my big focus was, was the Civil War. And then for graduate school, I came back here to St. Louis um, and, and actually went to Webster University, where I got my nonprofit leadership master's degree. Um, and, and really that degree itself and, and that decision to go with the nonprofit side uh, was, was very, uh, very impactful for me in my professional life. Uh, because that gave me a bit of diversification in really what I wanted to do, um, trying to set myself apart uh, in, in, in the field of history and, and especially museum studies. So I really wanted to go with the side of the administrative end of museum work um, and, and knowing the ins and outs of how you run a 501c3 nonprofit like the museum is. Uh, while I was actually in undergrad, um, that's where I started to really kind of dip my toes in, in different parts of the museum world and public history. Um, I had an internship with Harper's Ferry National <laughs> Historic Site in West Virginia. And that really got, got me involved and in, in giving me experience in working with school groups of kids that would come to the park. And I was working really with our education department. Um, so I was able to do tours for, for youth as well as educational classes. Um, I also had a lot of experience with special collections at Gettysburg College, um, so working within the archives, so I had that, that end as well. Um, and then I was also doing a lot of research as well with the Civil War Institute at Gettysburg, um, so that really kind of set me up for what I really wanted to do. Um, I've been able to, fortunately, been able to really work as well with the American Battlefield Trust, uh, which is the nation's largest uh, nonprofit for battlefield preservation. And I was able to work with, with their development team and that also gave me that development side. So I, as you can tell, I, I was trying to figure out exactly what I wanted to do and, and ended up going with that nonprofit side. Um, so I've been so fortunate here at the museum, being museum director here, giving, that, giving me that opportunity to really give back to the organization that I love and, and really Missouri Civil War history, which has been uh, drastically overlooked uh, in the annals of Civil War history. Um, but really here at the museum, what I'm mainly responsible for is the day-to-day -day operations of the museum. So um, a lot of times I'm working here at the desk. So right now I'm actually here in the gift store uh, with my computer. So just being here, filling in the gaps where, where, um, where I'm needed. Uh, but really what I do here as well on top of just the day-to-day -day management is working on exhibits. Um, that's kind of really been what I've fell in love with doing as well here at the museum is, is to develop our exhibit panels, um, help to plan out which artifacts we're putting in which case, um, what kinds of stories we, we want to tell through our exhibits. So a lot of it is just the writing of the exhibit text and what exactly we want to do. Um, I've been able, fortunately, been able to work with um, a lot of our videos and creating those. So then we're able to give that visual experience as well for our visitors here at the museum. Uh, so we, we've been able to develop several videos in the in the museum that just enhance our exhibit galleries. Uh, so that's been that's been absolutely wonderful. Also here at the museum we do tours of Jefferson Barracks County Park as well as our National Cemetery. 
Um, so, so we do definitely add that history side and the public history side to it. Um, but, but yeah, that's really, really it about the, the museum itself. Um, you know, one of the things that we really pride ourselves on here at the museum beyond the preservation side um, is how many exhibit or how many artifacts we have out on exhibit. Uh, currently, we have about 750 items out on two floors of exhibit. So um, we, we definitely pride ourselves on really showcasing as many artifacts as we can um, and, and really trying to expose people to um, really the material culture of the American Civil War era and what people would have been using and, and what kinds of weapons. Um, so we have a lot of that out on display. Thank you, Kirsten. Tim? You are on mute. Thank you, Mandy, for inviting me to participate. And it's good to see um, everyone on the call and, and listen to some of my colleagues in other parts of Missouri. It's fascinating. Uh, we all have different paths, but there are similarities, I think, in, in how we got to where we are. Um, I won't spend a lot of time talking about America's National Church Museum um, or the facility because that's right on campus. and. You'll have plenty of opportunity to do that if, 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 if not already. And I don't think several of the students in the class are, are, are already working at the, at the museum. But I'll give you a little background on, on, on how I came to be here. Um, I think you know, the, when, when I was thinking about museums and, and a career in museums, um, I relied on my own sense of curiosity more than anything else. Uh, it started when I was in high school, actually, even before I. I went to college, um, I, I visited museums and I, I, I lingered uh, and I tried to have conversations with you know, security guards or with uh, gift shop managers or librarians. And I'd kind of wheedled, wheedled my way into to, to the libraries and, and start to look at archives. I was fascinated by the original object. Um, and uh, it was my sense of curiosity that often um, served me well, uh, even as a young person going into um, college because, you know, and this is a really great plus for the students here today, um, people in the field want to help you out. Um, there's, you know, there's not a lot of people, you know, there are a lot of people wanting to be nurses, a lot of people want to be computer programmers, a lot of people want to be um, this or that. There aren't a lot of people clamoring to be museum studies folks. Um, however, um, people in the field are incredibly uh, generous in my experience in, in helping you out. Uh, so do ask questions, do show up, do ask, hey, where'd you get that catalog or, um, you know, what, what, how did you get involved? Um, that's, that's my number one bit of advice to, to each of you at this phase of your career. Be curious and visit as many museums as possible. I certainly did that. Uh, Kathy mentioned the Milwaukee Public Museum. I grew up in Waukesha, Wisconsin, so that was my first big museum. And I remember pushing the button and making the rattlesnake, you know, thing go and all that kind of stuff. Um, and I, I, I just visited as many museums as I can. And as an undergraduate, um, I decided to major in art history um, because the, to me, that was museums. I visited a lot of museums, uh, art museums, and, and figured that art history was a great chance for me to um, take the natural curiosity I had about a lot of subjects, not just art but history, music, theater, culture, politics, poetries, basically all of the humanities uh, found their way uh, in some ways into art history. And there were pictures, you know, it's great. When the professor gave you 200 pages of, of reading, half of them were pictures. It was a great, great um, assignment. Uh, so I, I gravitated to that and I did some internships when I was in college. And that's a refrain I think you'll hear time and time again from those in the profession that, um, being involved in internships is a great way to, to, to get involved. I happen to be fortunate enough to internship at the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York as an undergraduate. And um, that internship was a summer internship, it was a paid internship. Um, and I was from Wisconsin, so a small Midwestern town kid goes to Manhattan for a summer. I was nervous and excited at the same time, but I, here I was working at the Met. I did the same thing I'd always done. Uh, I asked questions and I, I was just, um, my curiosity, uh, I think people were, I was, I was that kid, you know, I was that intern who kept saying, well, what about this or what about that? And um, people just helped out. And um, I was fortunate enough, I remember um, meeting with a small group of three interns and, and, and the director of the Metropolitan Museum of Art, a very, very busy, busy man at the time. And he took time and, and, and talked to us and, and we chatted for him about an hour and a half. And um, it was the kind of conversation that very few people have a chance to get to, but because of that internship, um, I grew close to the Met. 
And my senior year in college, um, I got a call from the person who was in charge of the internship program um, at the Cloisters, which is a branch of the Met, and said, you know, we'd love to hire you. Um, you know, if you have no pro pro you know, pro projects or, 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 or aspirations or lined up after, after college, um, we'd love to, to bring you out to, to, to New York and, and, and hire you um, in the museum education department. And I said, I didn't even think about it. I said, yes. Um, didn't know what the pay was. I didn't, I said, yes, absolutely. And, and I found myself on a path, you know, shortly after graduation, moving to New York City and, and working at the Met for seven years. Um, in tandem, I found myself doing some graduate work at Columbia University uh, in, and in art history, medieval art history. And I became immersed in the museum education world. As Kathy said, it's, it's a world where you uh, work with curators, you work with volunteers, you work with students, you work with teachers. Uh, and it's, it's a great chance to uh, meet a, a wide variety of, of people. I, in my case, I worked for the medieval art department. So I was actually a museum educator within the medieval art department at the Cloisters, which was an unusual situation at the Met. But I found myself, um, as Lena said, and as Kathy said, um, and as Christian just mentioned, you know, you, you fill in where you have to, uh, and sometimes you fill the front desk, sometimes you end up running a program because, you know, th 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 there's a transition and you find yourself uh, in, in a position. I ran the concerts and lectures program up at the Cloisters for three years, um, and I was fortunate to do that, and I, again, that opened a whole new world for me, and began to do um, some events and some fundraising with the museum uh, for some of the trustees, and got the pull in, in fundraising. Um, I ended up moving back to Wisconsin to work in the fundraising arena at my alma mater, a liberal arts college in, in, in Wisconsin. And um, I did that for about six or seven years. Um, fundraising is incredibly important in, in the nonprofit arena. Uh, we rely on grants and individuals and donations. And, and for museums, we rely on donations of objects to build collections. Uh, so having uh, a good knowledge uh, and, and familiarity with best practices for fundraising is, is incredibly important. And I got that in spades while working in the development office um, at Lawrence University. I missed art. I missed it. And I, I had to get back into it. So when I was afforded the opportunity to, to take a, a job as the director of a museum in Wisconsin, um, I did and um, jumped back in, into the museum world uh, as a director of a small uh, museum. Uh, which led me to the Churchill world, interestingly enough, because one of our the development work, the fundraising and the museum world intersects, the benefactor of the museum said, you know, I'd like to do a Churchill exhibition, exhibition at the museum, I'll pay for it. Anyone in the museum, you know, who's strapped for funds says, really, wow, that's a conversation starter. Uh, and uh, and, and, and uh, so um, we, we launched a, a, a Churchill exhibition at this museum in Wisconsin, and I didn't know anything about Churchill at the time. So I called uh, the National Churchill Museum uh, and actually talked to Liz and, and, and Rob Havers, who's the director at the time, among others. And we put together a really uh, nice exhibition uh, in Wisconsin on Churchill. And that, that, that uh, opened up a number of doors for me uh, in the Churchill world that led me to the path I'm in now. But uh, all this to say, it was really a series of opportunities and, 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 and curiosity and, and, and just asking a lot of questions, particularly when I was younger. Um, I had the opportunity to, to do some research uh, and study in Italy um, for a semester as an undergraduate. But, but again, there, I just asked questions and I found myself in, in, in the archives of the, the, the Laurentian Library um, or in the Duomo in Florence. Uh, whereas my, my other colleagues and, and, and classmates, you know, were, were busy um, you know, having a glass of wine on the Arno, I was the one who was asking those crazy questions and saying, "How can I? How can I get access to the original objects and see them?" And it was the insatiable curiosity that, that led me to that, which I still have. Um, and um, asking for for people, that energy you have and enthusiasm for the subject will get people's attention uh, and, uh, and open doors for you, as, as I think they did for, for me. Um, I've been fortunate to, to work in you know, one of the largest museums in the country in the Met, uh, and then now lead the, 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 the small but mighty Churchill Museum at Westminster College. Um, but th there, there are commonalities here, and it's, it's, it's you know, get internships when you can, um, practice your communication skills. Uh, I think all the while throughout my career, I've always, um, found a, a knack for, for, for writing uh, and for, for communicating 
Um, that's incredibly important in the museum world and it will set you apart. Um, and those who can do it well to interpret the uh, uh, collections in, in, in visual form in, in, or, or in speaking forms, and speaking or, or writing is, is, is really important. Um, so those are some, some tidbits that, I, that I, I, I'll, I'll leave it there for now and we can uh, perhaps have more in the questions and turn it over to, I think, Liz who may be next, right? Yes, Liz will be next. And then again, as you think of questions, you can type them in the chat box or just keep them and you can unmute yourself when, when we get to that point. Um, but Liz, do you want to go next? Yes, thank you. Um, it's really great to be here today. Um, and when Mandy first asked me to, to join and, and talk about my career in museums, it was really it was kind of a little bit of a trip because you think to yourself, okay, well, you're, just, you're going along, going along, and then you, you look back at when you started in museums and then you do the math and you're like, holy cow, I've been doing this for a while. It doesn't feel like it's been that long, but um, I, I've i always loved museums, kind of the same theme with everyone um, on the call here. I They've always been home to me. I grew up in Chicago, so we had access to amazing museums. And, um, when we were kids, going to museum camp was cheaper than babysitters, so we went to a lot of museum camps when we were kids, and it has afforded me a lot of um, a lot of poking fun, but also it's it's why I'm at where I'm at. And uh, anytime I have a chance to work with campers, I, I enjoy working with summer campers because I'm like that was me at one point, and one day the one of one of you will be me. Anyways, um, my academic background, I got my um, Bachelor's of Science in Historic Preservation from Southeast Missouri State. Uh, I was very interested in preserving things and buildings and how do you keep things around and objects and, you know, growing up being in museums and like watching Indiana Jones and wanting to be Indiana Jones, you know, I had this idea that I was going to find some rare object and put it on display or something like that. Um, so I got my degree in Historic Preservation and along that time, um, also did several internships, most of them unpaid for local uh, museums, helping sort collections, rehouse collections, catalog collections. Um, and I learned quite quickly that the collections world, and it's going to be very ironic, <laughs> was not necessarily for me. Um, I was very good at that and I enjoyed that, but deep down in my heart, I'm an educator. I love talking to people about um, different science topics, the natural world, that is where my, my passion is at. But the other thing you will find with museums is sometimes you just have to stick with it and getting your foot in the door and asking those great questions and just spending time in museums is better than like waiting for the right job because that's in life that's generally never going to happen and especially in museums by sticking with those different roles that might not necessarily be your perfect piece, um, you can find a nice little niche. So I did know that in order to continue in museums, this was back in the early, in 2008, I would probably need a master's degree. Um, and I was at a place where I wanted to be in Europe for a while. And I found a degree program in England in museum education. So hopped over the pond, um, took out a huge giant loan <laughs> and um, went and got my master's in museum education. And with that program, we were required to do an internship that I got to do at the Natural History Museum in London, which was so absolutely amazing. That's just, to this day, is one of my favorite museums on the planet. It's just architecturally beautiful. It's got this really great set of collections. The education program is really fun and dynamic. It's just a really nice kind of marriage of both of those. Um, so definitely, if you get a chance to go over to London, um, check that out for sure. When I got back to the States, um, I was looking for a job in museum education. I really, really wanted to be in museum education. Um, I could not find anything, but I did know some people in Jefferson City, Missouri, who knew that the Churchill Museum was looking for some curatorial help. And again, I had done that work before. Um, I was very comfortable with it. I had just spent a year in England. So I was a little bit of an Anglophile, really wanted to like continue to be immersed in that English culture world. Um, 
so I came over to the Churchill Museum and, and kind of like Lena, I just squatted there for a while and was every three or four months would ask Rob, so do you want to pay me to do this or can we figure that out? <laughs> and I think finally, maybe just after a year of asking, he he probably just gave in <laughs> and was like, okay, fine, why? Well, um, so I came on board as their uh, curator archivist and I was there for three years and it was a really it was a really fun role because it, it's a small museum. So we got a chance to do an awful lot of things. I worked with Mandy as well. She was actually our educator at the time. So whenever there was a program that required objects, Mandy and I got to work together on that. You know, she would take the lead and make sure we were checking all the education boxes. And then I would get to bring out the artifacts and show those off. Um, I learned how to curate an exhibition, how to find different types of shows, how to work with a budget. Um, both pros and cons, a lot of the fundraising and friend raising that they, sometimes they just don't teach you in grad school, I will be honest. <laughs> um, I got a chance to, to try out at the Churchill Museum because we were a smaller staff. Um, I actually got to go with our executive director when it came to talking to different donors or wanting to try out different collections or um, Bombing up to Wisconsin with some Churchill paintings in the back seat. Um, the smaller institutions, they're really a really great resource. One for uh, just showcasing the history of a particular subject, but also as a professional, they give you a chance to really flex your skills in different ways. And um, I'm forever grateful for my time there because I just got to do so many different things. And I especially learned there especially, especially, I do not like archives. I'm not, I'm not detail oriented enough for the archive world. <laughs> and so whenever there was an archive type project, I would work very, very closely with a intern or a student who had that skill set. Um, because I am a very, I'm a clumsy person. So all of the Churchill paper type things in the collection, Tim, don't worry, I'd never touched because I didn't want to rip them. You can ask Mandy, I'd be like, uh, We'll deal with that next year. <laughs> it's safe. We'll deal with it next year. Um, after, I should say, before the Churchill Museum, when I was still kind of trying to find my way, I did spend some time with Missouri State Parks, and that was a lot of fun. I was outside educating. Um, that was really great, and I actually had to leave State Parks to go get my master's degree, um, but that's where I learned about um, education and interpretation, which is an informal education approach. Um, had a really great time with that, jumped into grad school and into the Churchill Museum, um, decided that I wanted to get back to St. Louis. I had lived in St. Louis during my, uh, my high school years, and I wanted to kind of be back in that area and found um, a position with La Meyer Sculpture Park as their collections manager. So going from managing um, a smaller collection to an outdoor public art collection um, was actually, was a lot of fun. Um, the tools of the trade included a weed whacker and a chainsaw, um, cutting things down around the collect around the actual collections of sculpture. Um, so that was a really nice, nice bridge back into more of a uh, hands-on type role. And while I was at Laumeyer, they were looking to expand their engagement with the docent program. And because I had worked with the docents in training them how to talk about the art and you know what you saw and what the, the point was behind it and to give them a chance to kind of use their own um, inquiry to learn a little bit more about it, I was able to move into an education role. So again, it's that, that moment where it's not necessarily the most perfect, but the content area and the subject matter was intriguing enough to stick around and, and see what could kind of come from that. So I, um, got to be an educator at La Meyer Sculpture Park, which was just so much fun because I was pretty well managing the docents. And anyone who's managed docents, Kathy, you'll know this, uh, the docents manage you and you are just okay with that. <laughs> so if you're ever gonna manage docents, just know that you are not managing them, they're managing you. Um, and we just had a really great time running around the park and um, really enjoying the park. Uh, La Meyer then, um, they were kind of shifting their docent program and I was wanting to get to a bigger 
organization because I realized that I really, I enjoy doing the education, but I also enjoy kind of that lobbying for budget to get, get educators access to money so they can do fun things. Um, so the Science Center was actually hiring someone to help manage their floor programs. And um, I took a jump at that. And I've, I've been at the Science Center for four years now, and my role has kind of shifted and changed. But it's always pretty well been supporting our gallery staff to get them the funds they need to keep science education alive. And it has been a really, really fun job. My family are all very, very scientifically oriented. Um, they work in labs, they work in computers, they work in power plants, and I'm the one who's like, I like museums, I think they're fun. <laughs> so I've grown up around scientific terms and jargon, so now taking that and interpreting it for our visitors feels quite natural um, to me. And I, uh, I manage our floor team, including our planetarium team, and we are just out there every day with the visitors, engaging, uh, using interpretation, which is again an informal education tool, and just having a really great time figuring out um, what it means to educate during, through, and during a pandemic. Um, I would say my biggest lesson that I've learned is just stick with a museum long enough where you can really learn the things you weren't expecting to learn and spend time as much time as you can regardless of your role um, with the visitors because they will show you what they like what they don't like what they're interested in and they will have some of the craziest most amazing questions um, and they are really the, the backbone and why we're we're here um, and just be willing to to try something a little bit different and I think that's what I, I love about museums is it's a skill set that you learn on the job that you just really, you can't teach unless you're in it, but it's just so diverse and um, just kind of different that it, it, it keeps you coming back for more. So um, yeah, and keep asking questions too, because museums have a really fun way of answering those questions. The different types of jobs just they can't get to in the way museums can. I think that's it. Am I at time? I should be at time. Yeah. Okay. Thanks, Liz. Um, so for our attendees, our students, do you all have any questions for our panelists? Um, I've got a few here that I've written down. And panelists, if you all have questions, please feel free to ask. But I wanted to allow the students some time first um, to see if they have any. Okay, I'm gonna ask Kirsten. I have a question. So a lot of y'all mentioned either er, the education side of things or collections and stuff. Um, what is each of y'all's favorite like area in museum and why? It's a good question. You mean as far as like, um, area to work in a museum or area in a museum? <laughs> so like in terms of like um, different departments and museums, so that oh. type of area. I guess I would answer and say education is my favorite because that's all I've pretty much ever known. And I like, I, I kind of to echo what um, Liz was saying, that I think the most, important person in a museum is the person walking through the door, the visitor. And that you sort of learn a lot from people who come. I, I find that I learn a lot from, from that. And so I think I would be frustrated to not have more interaction with visitors in other positions. Yeah, I, mean, I would say that, um, you know, being, I, I'm really at the front desk a lot here at the Civil War Museum. I think probably my favorite part is, is, is really interacting with the general public, be it through tours, 
Um, you know, again, we, we do a lot of tours of the National Cemetery. Uh, we do tours of Jefferson Barracks County Park. We don't really do too much with tours within the museum galleries themselves. And that's just because of the number of artifacts we have out, um, as well as numerous exhibit panels in each of our cases. So there's a lot of information there. And we have a lot of videos as well throughout the museum. But I think interacting with the general public through those kinds of tours and seeing the, just looking at their faces and seeing them light up as you're as you're telling them stories or um, as they're pondering questions or, or trying to get them to, you know, to really think about the relationship between themselves, their emotions, the power of place, as we as we like to say in, in, in history, um, especially at these historic sites, and then seeing you're really hearing the questions that they may pose um, about certain topics or whatever, whatever you're, you're, you're discussing. And then on that same note, interacting with the public and seeing seeing their faces and, and, and seeing them light up as they as they leave the museum, um, and they head into our gift store, which is kind of the last stop they have in the museum and as I asked them like well what did you think about the museum did you enjoy it and then to hear all the the variety of responses that come in from oh yeah that was really interesting or, or gosh it was you know this was a, an incredible museum or my favorite part was so and so because you start to hear about what the public likes and, and I think that's kind of what, what some of our other panelists were, were saying is the, the really the public the visitors are the most important part of these museums without them, because like for us at the Civil War Museum, um, the bulk of our revenue comes from our membership program and our admission fees that we do have in the museum. So when people do come in, you know, they're paying that admission fee to go through and, and for them to really enjoy their experience and, and wanting to talk about and discuss um, wh whatever topic they would they would like, especially when it comes to the Civil War. I mean, that's a very controversial and hot topic sometimes. Um, but but people really do enjoy that kind of conversation, and you learn so much from what they like, what they enjoyed, um, as well as some recommendations. Sometimes, sometimes they have things that they want to say, like, "Hey, I would suggest doing this." So there's there's so much you can learn from the general public. Um, but it's it's such a joy to be able to interact with them, um, especially being on that administrative side most of the time is you know, really part of my role. Um, but to be able to interact with the public is it's, you learn just so much from them. Lena, did you want to share? Oh yeah, sure. Uh, I guess for me, it's a little bit of sort of like a different perspective. Um, Cause I guess I'm just like not as much of a people person. So I do sort of enjoy like being on the back end where sort of, you know, the part that the public doesn't really see, but sort of making that content uh, and making sure that all those like objects are taken care of so that people can enjoy them and continue to enjoy them. I have to share, I have to share something real quick. I know I'm not on the panel, but um, I, I would pick education just like Kathy, love it so much. And I had realized that I had always thought about becoming a classroom teacher and then as a museum educator, I would have conversations with classroom teachers and I realized, well, I have a whole lot more freedom as a museum educator to do really whatever the heck that I wanted to. So I liked, like that was a validating moment for me that I was in the right place. No but grading. I am, what? No grading. <laughs> <laughs> no grading, no test taking, none of that stuff. Um, but I am very much an introverted person. And so funny story, I would use Liz's office as my um, secret hideaway. <laughs> For those who've worked in the collections area at the Churchill Museum, you know, no one really goes over there. Um, and so if, uh, whenever I would need a break from people, including a bunch of children, I would run over to Liz's office and hide for a few minutes. I may or may not have hidden from Rob as well on a few occasions, but Anyway, I had to interject that. So sometimes introverted people end up in extroverted positions and you just got to find ways to cope. <laughs> well, there's also an incredible, I, I watch the curators in that, you know, they spend a lot of time doing research and less time with the public. And there's that satisfaction of putting on a good exhibition and the preparators who set up the 
exhibitions. I mean, you know, they get a lot of credit because what they do is beautiful and sometimes very demanding, you know, how to fit something in a case and make it look good and put the labels up so they're well done. So it really is a team effort, but yeah, I, I agree. Yeah, and bouncing off of what Kathy just said, I mean, you know, I, again, we have such a small staff here at the Missouri Civil War Museum that we fill in a variety of roles, uh, which is such a blessing, but it's also pretty crazy at the same time. Um, but, you know, working also in the exhibit realm, you know, creating the panels, writing the stories, doing all the research, and then you put it all together, and then you, then you interact with the public. I, I know I'm in a very unique kind of position working the front desk, but also working on exhibit panels and working on artifacts and all that, um, that, uh, that allows you to really just get so much joy and satisfaction out of seeing people just enjoy the museum and to learn about all these stories of people who were impacted by a particular subject, you know, not only Civil War for us here at the Civil War Museum, but also like, you know, learning about, I don't know, different, different dinosaurs at the science center or or just or, or learning about different artists and seeing their work and, and to bring that all to life and then to see the joy of people's faces as they as they leave and or even when they enter the museum it's just it's such such a beautiful thing to see i'll chime in a little bit i, I, I was just thinking about the word museum we don't think about it. We take, you take museum studies, you take a class, you go to a museum. But, you know, it really comes down to the muse, you know, to be inspired. And that's what we do. Uh, we try to use collections in the past and our stories to inspire, um, whether that's to inspire an, uh, an interest in science or history or art or whatever the topic may be. Um, that's where we all, I think, from what I've heard, everyone here is we get satisfaction when the public is inspired. Uh, and whether that's through an exhibition, through a publication, through a video, uh, through a, a really well-maintained collections database uh, that, that, uh, that can be used to, to inform and inspire the public, that, that's what really gets me, I mean, is, is, is the ability to inspire. And, and one of the things, there's an interesting article that was published a few years ago now that said the public, the general public, trusts museums. Mm -hmm museums more than universities, more than newspapers, more than magazines, certainly more than our government. Uh, but it seems that, the, that there's a general trust in museums, that when you go to a museum, you're going to get a story that makes sense, that's presented um, in the best sense, mostly unbiased, uh, and that you can trust it. Uh, and I think it it, 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 it's really a, an honor to, to work for an organization uh, like a museum that, uh, that the public trusts. Uh, and then when, when you have that good interaction, as everyone has said, you know, when, when you see that interaction with the visitor who says, wow, I'm really excited about this, you've done your job and, and you've continued that trust. Um, that's why we do what we do, I think, in that, in that way the case for me. Yeah, um, I'm going to, Liz, did you have anything to share? Otherwise, I'm going to ask one question. Okay, um, I know we're over the four o'clock time. Um, our class actually doesn't end until 4.15, but if you panelists are okay, I'd like to ask just one more question of you all um, before we close, close out this program. Um, this is actually something Kathy and I had talked a little bit about prior to hitting that record button and everyone coming in. Um, but the museum field, you know, there's not a lot of people coming in. Tim, Tim referenced that early on, you know, there's not a lot of interest um, in museum careers. It's a smaller field, um, which means it's sometimes harder for entry level individuals to get their foot in the door within, within a museum. You know, we all know internships are a great way to get your foot in a door. Volunteering is a great way to get your foot in the door. Um, but do you all have any advice for, for our students here and those who may watch at a later time? Um, you know, once graduation comes and they're looking for their first museum job, what advice would you give them, um, just given how hard sometimes it is to get into working into a museum? Oh, 
Well, I, I would just encourage everyone to, to get your foot in the door, you know, period. Get an internship, even if it's, if you can swing it, if it's uh, unpaid at first, try to, uh, if you can you know, try to find some funding or get some funded internship, that would be great. And um, as, 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 as we've all said, um, there's so much work to be done. And, and we've, we, yeah, everyone on the panel has said, I wear many hats. Uh, and because there's so many hats, we're looking for people to, to try them on every now and then. Uh, and if you have an intern to, to wear your hat, um, it's very welcome. And, and, and as, as Lena said, as Liz said, uh, and in my case, you, know, you linger around. I had an internship at the Met and they called me and said, do you want to work here? Um, it tends to lead, lead to things. So, so don't be afraid to, to, to get, your, get your foot in the door. It's, it's, it's not, the door's not locked. It really isn't. Sometimes you have to knock on it. Uh, and sometimes you just have to push through it. Um, that's that would be my recommendation. I think, yeah, that's absolutely true. And and what Liz said earlier is just take any job. You know, if they've got, you know, if it's like sweeping up stuff, that's great. I mean, you know, and, and as Tim said, if you can afford it, you know, a lot of times that people are happy to have you unpaid. And that's unfortunate that museums can't afford to pay everybody, but. It's a sad fact. I would encourage you to start now. Don't wait until you graduate. The Callaway County Historical Society needs help. I'm sure the Churchill Museum needs help here and there. Um, like Kathy had kind of said, sometimes you have to knock on the door. Um, unfortunately, sometimes with our multiple hats, we get bad with our multitasking and forget to ask for help. So maybe ask for help. <laughs> so I know it's a skill that sometimes museum folks, you know, we don't want to admit we don't have, but we're like, oh, we'll take it. It's fine. Just put another hat on. Um, but start now and start learning what you like, what you don't like, um, what you enjoy, what you don't enjoy. And just don't be afraid to get on a museum's website. And even if it's like info at museum.com, hey, I'm a student really interested in museums. I'd love to work with you. I get a lot of those emails forwarded to me and you know we figure something out. Sometimes we can pay a little bit, sometimes we can't. And don't be afraid that because it is you know connected to a university or connected to you know like the science center, and, oh it's so big, they won't have anything. Don't be afraid to ask. And don't be afraid to be specific. Experience. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, then you'll have experience. I I do not know what to tell people about getting a master's degree. I really, I, you know, because of COVID, I just don't know about graduate school. I'm sorry. I wish, you know, I could be certain and say, oh, you need to go to graduate school if you want to work in a museum or, but, you know, I really, maybe somebody else is more sure. I think it will depend on the museum. Um, I know when I was applying, I actually got really lucky and landed the Churchill Museum job before I even graduated from my graduate program. Um, but they were specifically looking for someone with a master's program um, or a master's degree. But I know there are many others who are just looking for bachelor's degree or master's is preferred. But if you have a bachelor's degree, um, it's okay. And so actually that's an advice, point of advice I'd like to give, especially for Alex, because she's um, graduating at the end of the calendar year um, as you're looking at job descriptions, if it says bachelor's degree required, master's degree, degree preferred, apply. Like don't, the preferred means preferred. Hey, it'd be nice, but we'll, we still want to consider you if you just have a bachelor's degree. So don't count yourself out, just apply to whatever you find. And I'd also just go right off of what Mandy was saying. Um, my big piece of advice would be don't be afraid of taking like the job in the gift store. Uh, just start putting your foot into the door, uh, get involved, start making connections. Sometimes those smaller jobs lead into something way bigger. Um, I know that that sometimes these these smaller jobs or these internships, they can blossom into full time positions doing exactly what you want to do. And then and also inquire with those people, start talking to um, other museum professionals, talk to the staff at that museum and, and figure out like, what exactly do I want to do and how do I 
get to that position. And also just kind of adding on the whole graduate school conversation, you know, um, I would, I always tell our interns here at the museum to diversify, find ways to diversify yourself, you know, be it uh, you know, going in for a master's degree in nonprofit leadership or, or going into the museum field, looking to do more nonprofit side or graphic design or something that sets you apart from all the other people who are applying. I know that that's one of the difficulties, especially in like the St. Louis area, is trying to get your foot in the door with uh, some of those institutions here because we just don't have that, that massive museum presence like the East Coast may have. Um, sometimes you got to be willing to just, you know, get yourself out of your comfort zone, uh, try whatever you can and just start making those connections and, and diversify, be, be unique, be yourself, but also think about different creative ways to set yourself apart from everybody else. Okay, so I lied. <laughs> I have one last question before we end. Um, a, do you recommend students join a museum professional association? B, if you do, what, which organization do you suggest for, for our students here? I would recommend you spend time um, dabbling with the Midwest Association of Museums and um, the National Association for Interpretation. I don't know if joining at this moment would be worth it. I won't um, tell anyone you said that, but I agree. And in the national, the uh, American Alliance of Museums is incredibly expensive even for the student mm -hmm. price. There's also the, um, uh, Academic Association of Museums and Galleries, but I think you're right, and I think MAMA, the Missouri Association of Museums and Archives, that might mm -hmm. be a good one, and you know that, and they advertise jobs too. Yeah, well, and there are so many webinars and online resources that you can access without being a member. Exactly, I think that's where it's at, and if you can swing a conference. Everyone's like, oh, go to AAM. At this point, for me, at my point in my career, and I'm about 12, 13 years in, AAM is just becoming relevant for me. Um, maybe with something more so regional. It is, it's so big. It's it is, easy to get lost there. Yeah. Something more regional, something more local might be a little bit more accessible at this it, moment. There's also like the National Council on Public History. So if you're looking for mm -hmm. more of the interpretive side, um, wanting to know more about interpretation, um, programming, all that, National Council on Public History is always a good option. Um, but yeah, I, I definitely agree with the rest of the, the panelists. I mean, I don't think it's necessary right now to, to get, to get a, a membership into those different associations, but just check them out. You know, if it can be very expensive, um, especially for, for students. So just kind of keep yourself open to the idea of, of, of being a part of one of those. But I mean, I don't think it's necessary by any means. Liz, what was, I'm sorry, Tim. Liz, what was the one you said after Midwest Association of Museums? National Association for Interpretation. Okay, thank you. I think with all of these organizations, um, if, if you take the advice we gave earlier about interning or you becoming affiliated, getting your foot in the door, a lot of our organizations are members. I mean, the Churchill Museum is a member of, of the American Alliance and we have access to those resources we're happy to share. You know, you don't have to be a member to be a beneficiary of some of the things we have access to. So if you can get affiliated with an institution or an individual who is a member, you know, you can become connected really by association. And that, that's a great way of doing it. Yeah, and just bouncing off of what Tim just said, I mean, um, the Missouri Civil War Museum is a member of the American Alliance, um, and we get their magazines, and we get um, like some discounts on attending the conference. Um, and and I can tell you that you know, with us getting all these magazines and articles in and different um, meetings and seminars, I mean, we take advantage of it here at the museum. And I'm not personally a member myself, but our organization is, and I think that's a great piece of advice, Tim. 
Yeah. I'll also say there's some, um, so like Facebook pages um, and other sort of groups like that for sort of like young, I think they're called specifically if you look it up, like emerging museum professionals, um, which are great as well. Um, and also some of those other organizations um, will also have sort of like subgroups where you don't necessarily even need to be a member. Uh, you can sort of get on like a mailing list. Um, another one I can think of, again, it's, it's a national one, but the American Association of State and Local History um, had an online conference recently. They had like a free tier of it. Um, there was definitely some really interesting stuff at that conference. Um, and also, um, this is more like webinar tutorial type stuff, but the um, American Institute for Conservation um, they have a bunch of um, free webinars that might sort of be helpful if you're looking into like what different roles might do because it's sort of like how do you deal with say like large vehicles in your collection I think that's like an upcoming one or like um, what kinds of storage should you use for um, your your collection so I feel like that's sort of like interesting with it, maybe you could get in and get some information. I could just sort of like, maybe even just like skip through some of those videos. Well, thank you all for joining us today. Panelists, thank you so much for agreeing to participate. Um, students, we are over time, so I, we won't have to, we won't stay on and um, chat, but we'll just see each other next Wednesday in class, okay? Okay. Thank you. So thank, thank you, you to the thank group. Panelists. <laughs> I um, learned a lot today. <laughs> I agree. Thank you guys. Thank you.